Luke, Luke, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We're going to be looking at verses 33 through 43 tonight. But a lot of times when we have Easter, I was thinking about it. And too many times we leave, we come to Easter, we look forward to Easter. Easter gets here. And once it's gone, we forget it. It's gone. We'll wait till next year and celebrate it again. We move, uh, we move on about our business. So we really don't really stop like we should and think about Easter more than once a year. But uh, the thought tonight is every Sunday ought to be Easter Sunday to us with what Christ did. So our, our little Bible study tonight uh, goes right back uh, to the crucifixion, and there's a lot of things I want to uh, uh, talk to you about. It says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the other, on the left, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not they do not know what they do. And we're going to come back and touch on, on some of these things. So I'm going to continue reading until I get, get to 43. And they divided his garments, and they cast lots. And the people stood looking, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. He appears to Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews... Save yourself. And an inscription was also written over his head. And it said in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew that he was the king of the Jews. And then one of the criminals who hang blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself. Don't miss this part. And us. If you're the Christ, save yourself, but also save us. But the other answering rebuked him and saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you would be you will be with me in paradise there is a story that you could sum it up saying that's the plan of salvation that's the plan of salvation showing how people uh, want to go about and God doing something for them all the time but them not doing, wanting to do anything for God and 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 wanting God to give them this, wanting God to give them that, and wanting God to give them the other, but they don't want to sacrifice their time, their uh, energy, or anything else to God. Just give it to me. Don't we live in that kind of world today where everybody wants something for nothing? I mean, this changed a lot in, in the years since I grew up. I grew up in the back patch and learned what work really was. Uh, don't want to go back there. I still work, but I don't want to work like that anymore. Uh, but guess what? Those were the good old days. That was the good old days. But the Bible tells us in John eight thirty six, if the Son sets you free, which Jesus did on Calvary, you will be free indeed. As I said, starting out, we always look at Easter. It passes by and we don't even hardly think about it again. We go on about our business. We do uh, different messages and and different things each Sunday, but we don't think about what Easter really is, where Jesus actually paid our sin debt in full. It's paid. Nothing else has to be done. Nothing can be done to make it better. Nothing can be done to make it worse. A whole lot of people are trying to make it worse, but uh, it's a sin debt that was paid in full. And Jesus, as we saw last week at Easter, took all that upon him, we ended up with victory, we ended up with faith, and we ended up with hope. And it all comes along with the resurrected Christ that we only think about a couple of times a year. You know, in our minds, we should think about him every day. Uh, so what I want you to see tonight is Easter is every Sunday. 
When Jesus done what he done on Easter, it was for every day. You know, we sing the song every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And if you truly got God in your heart, if you truly are, uh, have Jesus in the place in your life where he needs to be, it is sweeter than the day before. I don't know how many of you ride down the road like I do singing uh, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, but I sing it a lot. I sing a lot of songs about Jesus. But uh, one of the realities that we get out of the res resurrection is called atonement. Uh, that's a fancy church saying for uh, Jesus satisfied that debt of sin. That's what atonement means. And he paid the price for my sins. He paid the price for your sins when he took death upon himself and then when he was resurrected, he freed us from the obligation of the sin debt. It's not a debt to us anymore. It's been paid. You know, a, a lot of people like to, if, if you've ever had a bill, you know, you pay for uh, 60 months or something like that. When you get that last payment, you pay it, they stamp it, paid in full. That's what Jesus did. You don't have to go back and pay any more interest. You don't have to pay anything because it's paid in full. And that's why he was resurrected, and that's why he took sin upon himself. Uh, <clears throat> the debt to freedom is also something he gave us. We, are, we shall be free indeed. It's a debt to freedom. Uh, we have what out of freedom? We have redemption. We have salvation, and it's only found in Jesus Christ. Salvation you can't find anywhere else. You can't find it anywhere else in the Bible. You can't find it in any library in the world where you can be saved any other way than through Jesus Christ himself. It's found in him. It was a sacrifice. You know, we, we've talked about the lambs and the sacrifice where Jesus made himself that, that lamb and that sacrifice and it was a sacrificial death, and it was a victorious resurrection. That's what we saw last Sunday. Uh, uh, I, I have so much on my heart every year at Easter when we're standing right out there on that sunrise service. Used to, I wouldn't even go to a sunrise service till I started preaching. And since I started preaching and realized how important sunrise services are, and what the meaning of sunrise service is, it does something to your heart just standing out there listening to the birds sing. And, you know, we've had the moon for two years in a row uh, sitting right about yonder. And it just gives you a different feeling when you realize what you're really doing out there. We're looking where Jesus offered himself as a forgiveness for sins, a reconciliation with God. And we get something else out of that that we sometimes we don't even think about. What do we get by, by him forgiving our sins and by being reconciled to God? We get eternal life. Now, go back to the same statement I made a while ago. No book in the library anywhere in the world tells you how you can have an eternal life. Uh, you watch shows on TV like uh, Harrison Ford when he was trying to drink that cook that would... Uh, you know, what was the name of it? Anyway, there was eternal life there in the flow of that water. And the only way to eternal <clears throat> life is my favorite word. What is it? Believe. Believe the story of Easter and the story of re resurrection. That's the gift of eternal life. Uh, that's Christmas and Easter put together because you get a gift. It's free, it's a gift, it's called eternal life, and with that we get to go to heaven if we only believe. So it's not a transformation where we just change one or two things. Uh, it's not only a change in status, but we change spiritually inside. Uh, it helps us to become free. It gives us a purpose in life, and it gives us joy as children of God, just like I said, it gives me joy. Just to, it gives me. Let me tell you, it gives me joy every time I get up and preach. Every time I get up and preach and teach, I have more joy in my heart than I do any other time during the week. But it's joy as being now one of the children of God. My earthly debt has been erased. It's nothing that I done except for believe. Jesus done it all. He paid it all. 
Uh, he erased that debt. And as I said a while ago, John 8, 36 says, So if the Son of Man sets you free, you're free indeed. You're free indeed. There's some interesting things about the debts that are paid for us. Uh, there was a study done at a Royal College of Psych Psychiatrics around debt and mental health. And they found that half of the adults with a debt problem also live with mental ill health. It said they range from a consistent feeling of anxiety and low mood to diagnose mental health conditions just by being in debt. Debt can make you feel anxious, especially if you don't have support. It says debt can be a considerable burden to a lot of people, uh, made worse by dealing with it alone. Worrying about debt can affect your sleep. You ever been there? Losing out on a good night's sleep can not only affect your mood and your energy levels, it also affects your ability to work. It also affects your ability to have good relationships with people. It affects your ability to have a good relationship with your friends and your family. All of these things can add to your debt problems. All that to say, debt can be a very mental thing. It can be very emotional. And it can be a physical weight that people carry around on their chest all day long. But you know, as we read in scripture a while ago, Luke 22, 33, don't you just listen to it? And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. All this debt that Jesus was paying for, he's hanging on the cross. All of that debt that he was paying, there's a weight there. He had all that weight on him, but he made a statement, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive him. It didn't put him in anxiety. He didn't lose his spirituality. He grew stronger through the blood, through his blood and through praying to God. He grew stronger. And he, in all the pain and suffering and what he had to go through, he still made the comment, forgive him. That's how much he loved us today. So we see Jesus being nailed to the cross in Golgotha in these verses here. And he carried that wooden cross a long ways. So he had physical suffering also. And he endured the burden of humility, of humanity, sin, all that weighed on top of him. It was a sin debt that it was heavy. But he took it upon himself and he dragged that cross up the hill and it was internally, it was emotional to him also. So Jesus was human at that time. And it was internally emotional. In the midst of all this agony, <coughs> how can somebody say, Father, forgive them? <coughs> but he did. He did. All that pain, it, it just all goes to prove and to demonstrate the love that we can't even explain. We can try to explain it all we want to, but we can't explain the, the love that Jesus had, the weight of all that sin upon himself, and all the compassion that was in Jesus, and the grace that came out of Jesus, and he erased a debt that was weighed on us. That was a sin debt. If we don't have that erased, we're all bound for hell. No other way there, as I said, no book in the world, no dictionary, nothing in the libraries can tell you any other way to get to heaven than through Jesus Christ. So through all that and through the cross, you know what the cross was? The cross was a symbol of Roman oppression. They hung people on that cross so people could come by and look at them. And this is the way we're going to do you if you do something wrong in our laws, in the Roman laws. Uh, it, was, it, it showed the strength that the Roman government had. It showed the oppression that all these people were looking for the Messiah to come and take that, that strength and oppression away from Rome. And, but what does it mean to us as Christians once we accept Christ as our Savior, once we accept this as a true story that Jesus really done these things, what does it do for us? We see the cross as being victory, don't we? 
And then we start going down the road singing victory in Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, I sing a lot. We also, it shows that tomb's empty, uh, the wooden cross, the crown of thorns, it all shows the victory that Jesus Christ gave us. It reminds us of the promise, the redemption, and the reconciliation that they're real. They're not just stories. It's something that Jesus does for us. Look at verse 35 through 38. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of the chosen, I can hear those words so plainly, me being a disciple in the Easter play that we had for several years, and that's exactly what they were quoting while he was hanging on the cross. These people standing out there hollering up at him, if you're the Christ, bring yourself down. You know, if you're God's son, you can come down yourself. Uh, you saved others, how about saving yourself? They were making fun of him. It was, it was humility. And then the soldiers mocked him also, coming and offering him sour wine, saying, if you, if, you see all these ifs in there? If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So I'm sitting there like, these people can't be real. Making fun of them. I wonder, <clears throat> have you ever wondered if they made fun of people on the cross like that other than Jesus? I, I think it was an everyday thing for them not to make fun of people, put them on the cross, let them die, and they, you know, they got rid of them. But they, something was special about this man, and they wanted to ridicule him. They wanted to slander him. They wanted to do everything they could do to him. Uh, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Save yourself. He's hanging up there on the cross. He's being mocked by the crowd. But guess what he could have done? He could have come down any time he wanted to. He could have come down. Jesus remained steadfast in his mission of redemption. He had one thing on it on his mind, and that's what he was doing. I imagine that it took a lot for Jesus to stay focused on his plan with all the ridicule that he was getting. The book of Hebrews shed some light on how Jesus did it. How did he stay as calm and the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What Hebrews is saying right there, you're going to probably, once you become a Christian, go through some of the same ridicule that Jesus went through. This is how to overcome it. Think about Jesus on that cross. Forgive them. Not come down. Still won't be able to do what his mission had set him out to do. And then once we do that, we have to consider the joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's another song we sing. So they just keep popping in my mind. But we feel it a joy that comes from fulfilling our call purpose. But there's no joy any greater than what's waiting for us in heaven. We've got joy in heaven, and it's waiting for it. So what do we do? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We run the race that Jesus run. We go boldly down to the road of freedom the same way Jesus did. And our debt, the debt that we owed as we're going down that road, we can always say it's already paid for. And to me, it was free. But it was never free, was it? Jesus had to give his life for it. But to him, it was a gift, so it makes it free to us. And we're free indeed. And then look at verse 39. Verse 39 says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. He didn't care about anything else except getting saved. If you're who you say you are, take us all down off the cross, not just yourself. Take us all with you. As we look at these last passages here, uh, we find a mocking crowd making fun of Jesus. We also see a thief on the cross. 
that is along with the crowd, mocking him, save us. And then we find one person that all of a sudden recognizes his own sinfulness on that cross. But the other, in verse 40, asked and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed, he was saying, you and I, indeed justify for what we received due reward of our deeds we we deserve what we are getting but this man talking about Jesus has done nothing wrong you know what that was the truest statement that's ever been made by a human being because Jesus never did anything wrong and he's the only one that we can say that about but this man has done nothing wrong and then he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He just gave his life to Christ. The first convert that ever was was on the cross. As far as Christianity goes, you know, we don't have Christianity before, before Christ. We have people that got saved through the belief in God and the things that, that they believed. They followed God's instructions, but this is to Christ dying. Christianity means Christ-like. And here's the very first one that acknowledged that Jesus was innocent and that he was the Son of God. And he got saved. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and looked at him, and he offered him some uh, significant uh, assurance. And Jesus said to him, Shortly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not next week, not after the rapture, not after the resurrection, but today you will be with me in paradise. So this shows how people would get transformed through the power of redemption that gives their life to Christ and has genuine repentance. And I use that word very carefully because you know a lot of people say they, they have repented of their sins but it's not genuine they keep doing the same thing over and over again they haven't really given their life to Christ but genuine repentance takes faith in Jesus Christ and here these criminals are about to receive the same punishment in the eyes of the Romans they were killing them but Here's an innocent man hanging between them, the king of the Jews. You know, they don't know how right they made that sign when they said Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. They were making fun of him, but guess what's going to happen one day? He's going to be Jesus of Nazareth. He's going to be king of the Jews. He's going to be king of the world. And one of the criminals was fortunate enough to see through all these accusations, through all these things that they were doing to Jesus, that he was really who he said he was. And he accepted Jesus Christ right there on the cross. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's true. But also Romans 3.24 says, All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. No other way. It came through Jesus. What does that do for us? We've been set free. We've been set free. We've been released from that debt of sin. We've been released from that weight that's on us before we received that. Why? What I said a while ago. For if the Son of Man sets you free, you're free indeed. <coughs> so we close with that tonight, talking about one word, not believe. We all know about the one word believe, but we also talk about freedom what freedom really means. And it's freedom in the blood of Jesus Christ is given one way. It's given through him that follow him and that freedom comes to all that does my word believe in him. So redemption, freedom, it all comes through Jesus Christ.
And Jesus said, I surely to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He tells us the same thing today. If we receive him as our personal savior, he's going to see us in heaven because he's gone to prepare a place for us. And we've been set free. And we are, as Christians, free indeed. And I'll quit right there. Any questions or comments? Not Chris, if you dismiss this, please.